cows that are really struggling with an inflammatory insult like that are probably going to be going off feed um, and probably going to be losing milk production. Those are the two biggest ones. Hello, I'm Bill Weiss, host of the Dairy Black Belt Podcast. My guest today is Kirby Kronstadt. I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. Um, Kirby's a new assistant professor at The Ohio State University, and he's, he's actually in, in my old position, so I wish him the best. He's gonna be up, or he is up at the Worcester campus, and his uh, assignment is to integrate health and nutrition, and also nutrition and sustainability. Kirby, welcome to the Black Belt. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Bill. Um, we're going to, you wrote a uh, or co-authored a mini review uh, in Jer- JDS Communications on acidosis. I thought it was really, really good. Thank you. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And it, it has to do with uh, acidosis and inflammation. And mm-hmm. and what I'd like to start with is just how do you define systemic inflammation, and why is this such a big deal now? I was pondering that a lot as I wrote this paper. I think, you know, systemic inflammation, we're just trying to think of if we can measure inflammatory signals like acute phase proteins, which is what this review paper talked about mostly, if we can measure those in circulating blood, you know, you can have a local inflammatory insult like um, on a person have a bruise and that's a local inflammatory insult. But if it becomes systemic, then we might be changing that animal's biology, right? You know, like um, those acute phase proteins, if they're circulating widely, they might be having effects on other tissues and on that whole animal biology. So that's one of the reasons we like to think about um, systemic inflammation and how it might be affecting that whole system and being a little a little more integrative in our approach. And kind of general, before we get into acidosis, what are some clinical signs or observable signs of, of inflammation, of systemic inflammation? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest one is cows that are really struggling with an inflammatory insult like that are probably going to be going off feed um, and probably going to be losing milk production. Those are the two biggest ones. But otherwise, especially like transition cow inflammation or even acidosis inflammation, there's some things that are going to be hard to visually see walking through a pen of cows. But so those two are the easiest ones, you know, cows that are off feed and, and are making less milk than they should be are probably struggling with something under the hood. And we'll get to the uh, review paper now. And one, one thing you talk a lot about is acute, more acute acidosis. Mm-hmm. And you, you discuss a research model. First of all, would you tell the reader briefly on, on this uh, challenge model you talk about and which is pretty commonly used now? Yeah, it's, it's become a really nice predictable model to look at a dip in rumen pH. So what they do normally is feed a relatively standard lactation diet, something with, you know, 21 forage NDF and higher, 55, 60% dietary forage, something like that. And then they'll abruptly change that diet by increasing the amount of fermentable grain. And what the, most of the studies that I reviewed in this paper did was they incorporated barley and wheat in place of a portion, portion of that forage. And they do that suddenly. There's not a step-up basis. There's not a transition. It's a very sudden change. And then they'll feed that diet for a week, usually a week or 10 days. There's been very little work that's fed longer than a week or 10 days. And then they'll measure you know, uh, plasma samples, rumen pH, rumen LPS, um, and maybe some other systemic markers. And actually, uh, a few folks are starting to look at um, gut permeability markers like cobalt EDTA, chromium EDTA to give a better look at like the functionality of that gut layer. Um, so, but that's how these models work. But th- this wouldn't be so severe that it's like the clinical acidosis are found or it just, it's still, a, you'd still consider it subacute, but very abrupt. Right. Yeah. And actually the cows that we ran at Michigan State, um, they hardly went off feed. They kind of cruised right through it. But when you crack open the rumen, you would see some changes in rumen metabolism for sure. And do you think, you know, this model is, is good research model. Do you think it mimics the, the real world or the results you get? Do you think it mimics the real world? I think it can. Um, and I think it has to do with feed consistency, right? Especially the abrupt challenge models like this. You know, I think it it's not an unreasonable thought that on a dairy farm where maybe a weekend feeder comes in and dumps a couple of hundred extra pounds of corn into a wagon, that you might not have a subacute ruminal acidosis model that might mirror some of what's in literature. Um, so I, I think it's uh, reasonable to think that it's a good model for some of those challenges. And then on the on the starch, they, and you, you may have mentioned this, I missed it. How much starch do you feed in this challenge model typically? So when you do the 
math for some of the models out of Canada, it's usually about 32, 33% dietary starch. So it's not like outrageous. Not uncommon, actually. So no, you know, and there's more herds doing that. More herds doing that, getting 30, you know, 32% starch, still getting a 4.2 milk fat, you know, so it, it's not outrageous at all. But they do change from a corn grain usually to a wheat or a barley. So that's another wrinkle to add to that. So more ferment the the concentration of fermentable starch would be substantially higher than yeah, definitely a hotter diet. Um, and then you you do talk about acute changes like with this model, and then more chronic changes where you might bring them up on starch over days or weeks. What 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 differences do you see in there with respect to inflammation markers? Yeah, so actually, um, there's one experiment that I really like to reference, and it's uh, well, it's an old one of yours back from uh, 2015, and you had three groups in that experiment of a kind of a, I think a 24% starch diet, a 28% starch diet, and then one where there was a sudden increase um, about a week apart, where it went from 24 to 32, and then back to 24. And what you see is those cows on a chronically higher starch diet, they don't have any measurable impact that we can see in plasma. But those cows that had that sudden abrupt change in diet where um, the starch suddenly increased, again, I think from wheat in that study, wheat and barley, um, they had a, a blip on the radar for some of those inflammatory markers. So I think it was serum amyloid A spiked in that study for that group that had the um, the spike in diet for one or two days and then back down to a normal diet. So the the evidence in my mind it so far leans to that diet variation where if you have a spike in starch from one day to the next or a big change in diet, that might actually be part of the culprit um, for the inflammation that we see in these acidosis challenge studies. Um, cows that are well adapted to a diet seem to handle it well. And I think a feedlot steer is a perfect example. You know, those cows are, or those, those steers are eating an enormous proportion of their diet as starch. And they, and if they're stepped up onto it and managed in a, in a slick bunk managed well, they, they seem to do fine. Whereas um, we're talking about inflammation and acidosis in a dairy cow who is eating a diet that's 25 or 30 percent starch and why wouldn't they be able to handle that um so i think that the diet consistency seems to be a big piece of the story introducing ultrasorb r 3.0 volax comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants ultrasorb r 3.0 is a species specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants ultrasorb r 3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities endotoxins such as lps can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production learn more about ultrasorb r 3.0 at volac.com so you think just to to wrap up this this uh, podcast? So do you think again? It's not necessarily high starch. It's changes in starch, abrupt changes, or even maybe not real abrupt, but changes in in starch are, is a bigger concern in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've seen I've seen too much anecdotal evidence being on the farm where people are aggressively feeding corn to perfectly healthy, high producing, high milk fat cows, that the diet change is what would concern me more. So I, I always tell folks that make sure your weekend feeder or your evening feeder, or whatever the case may be, make sure that they're just as good at hitting their numbers as your regular full-time feeder is. That's, that's good advice. So thank you very much. Thank you.